you don't have to be a super massive Marvel nerd to understand this video, not like me. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw the new Avengers movie at the weekend, Infinity War. Loved it, obviously, because I'm doing this video on it now. For those of you who still haven't seen it, there are some mild spoilers ahead in case you want to wait. So did you know that 60 Symbols is actually in the Marvel comic book universe? So there's this one pane of an X-Men comic back from like 2015 where they have like an iPad on the table and it's clearly on YouTube and down the side is like number file and 60 symbols. And I'm just like, this video is about the Marvel Universe and the idea that someone in the Marvel Universe could be watching my video about the Marvel Universe, like it's so meta. So in the movie, there is a scene where some of the characters travel to a neutron star and this neutron star is being used as a weapons forge. I was really intrigued by this idea of whether you could use the energy from a neutron star to melt metal, i.e. to melt it down and turn it into a weapon. So in the scene, the characters sort of start up this neutron star. They have to reawaken it, apparently. Okay, so that aside. <laughs> um, and what they have to do is once they've reawakened it, they have to sort of like get the energy from the neutron star onto this bit of metal that they are trying to melt. And some mechanism breaks down and some grate that needs to be open is shut. And so one of the characters, Thor, says, okay, I'll hold it open. And so he takes the brunt of this energy from the neutron star, but he holds this grate open long enough so that the metal can melt. And he asks, how long do I have to open the grate for? And the other character uh, says, I don't know, about a minute. And I thought, would it really take a minute to melt metal with a neutron star? So a neutron star is the core of a collapsed star, so a star that's gone supernova. They tend to be around 10 kilometers across and sort of between about one and a half and three times the mass of the sun. So we're talking like the size of a city with three suns in it. Can we actually work out whether the energy we get off a neutron star is enough to melt metal? into a new weapon of some form, and how long would it take? To do that, we're first gonna have to know how much energy the neutron star is giving off. This is very well modeled if you treat the neutron star as a black body, and so we can use the Stefan Boltzmann law to do that. So, the Stefan Boltzmann law said that the power given off by somebody, J star, is proportional to the temperature of that body, so the temperature of our neutron star, to the power of four. And I figured I had to break out the equations again, because everyone commented on how nice my handwriting was last time, and that they said it should be made into a font. So I was like, I have to do this again. <laughs> Give the people what they want. <laughs> okay, so basically, if this is proportional, then there's some sort of proportional constant in here as well. So instead, we can write this as this power is equal to the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which I'm gonna represent with uh, a Greek sigma. That's not a six, it's a sigma. And the temperature of the neutron to the power of four, okay? So this power is basically the energy radiated per area per unit time. You'll notice there's a time in there, which is good, because we're trying to work out how long it's going to take this metal to melt. So we can write this basically as energy over the area that that energy is being beamed into and the time that it's being beamed over. So we have a time in there, so we need time for melt, and we have a temperature of a neutron star, great. So we need to know how much energy we need to give the metal in order to take it from, say, room temperature to its melting point, okay? So again, this has been very well studied, we know a lot about it, and it's all to do with the specific heat capacity of a material. The energy you can put into a material, E, is given by how much mass of that material you have, the specific heat capacity, which I'm gonna represent by C, and then the change in temperature. So this is delta T, so this is a nice scientific way of saying the change in something. The specific heat capacity is basically how easy or how hard it is to heat something up. So if you think about when you're boiling water on a hob or a stove, presumably the pan that you're heating it in is metal, and then you've got the water in the middle. So the pan on the outside actually gets very hot very quickly with the direct heat that's on it, but the water takes much longer to heat up, okay? So metal basically has a much lower heat capacity than something like water, which has a much higher heat capacity. So it basically says you have to put more energy in to increase the temperature of something. We need to work out how much energy we need to put in to that metal in order to melt it. And then that's how much energy we need from the neutron star. And then we can work out over what time the neutron star would that it would give that out and therefore how long it would take the metal to melt. The time that it would take to melt the metal is the mass of the metal times by the specific heat capacity of the metal times by the temperature that you need to increase the metal's temperature by, all divided by area of metal that you're heating. This 
Boltzmann constant sigma and the temperature of the neutron star to the power of four. Nice simple equation from some nice simple thermodynamics and it will help us work out how long it would actually take for you to melt some metal in a neutron star forge. Now we need to figure out some properties of the neutron star and some properties of the metal that Thor is melting in the film to figure out if we could actually do this. I looked up <laughs> what metal Thor's, why are you laughing at me? <laughs> I looked up what Thor's weapon is made out of. And Marvel tells us that it is made out of a metal called Uru, and it is a god-like metal. And that is all the information they give you. I was like, Marvel, why aren't you telling me it's melting temperature or <laughs> it's specific heat capacity? I need to know these things. <laughs> we can assume some things, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna assume is that it has a really high melting point because it takes quite a while. It takes about a minute in the film to melt this thing. So I'm gonna assume that it has a really high melting point. So I looked up, you know, metals, what has the highest melting point? Turns out it's tungsten. Tungsten has a melting point around about 3,700 Kelvin. I also need to know with my equation, how much of the metal that we're heating. So again, I turned to Marvel and was like, how heavy is Thor's uh, weapon? So unfortunately they don't quote a, a weight for his new weapon, the one that he's forging in the new, in the new film, in Infinity War, but they do quote his old weapon, his hammer, they quote it is 19.19 kilograms, which seems light to me, but whatever. And I'm gonna assume that basically they're heating about a meter squared-ish of metal, just to make the numbers nice and simple. Then we also need to know the temperature of our neutron star. So I looked up a couple of references that I could find online and I found one that basically said that, you know, typical neutron star that's not like fresh, brand new formed, but sort of pretty early on in its life. It's about 600,000 Kelvin. So then we need to plug all our numbers into our equation. So first of all, we need our mass, which we know is 19.19 kilograms. We need our specific heat capacity, which was 130 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. So that'll cancel out our kilograms here. And then the change in temperature. I mean, they're in space, so they're probably not at room temperature, but again, I'm gonna assume they're at room temperature. And I'm gonna say, you know, we need to go from room temperature to um, the melting point of tungsten, which we've assumed is the same melting point as this Uru, which is about 3,400 Kelvin. And then it's gonna be all over the area, which I said was only about a meter squared. That'll probably be fine. Uh, and then we gotta times it by this Stefan Boltzmann constant, which is, 5.67 times 10 to the minus eight. So that's a really small number. And then this temperature of the neutron star, which we said was 600,000 to the power of four. So if we plug all those numbers in and calculate it, would you like to know how long it would take to melt the metal with the neutron star? A nanosecond. Not exactly a minute, as they say in the film. I'm assuming Marvel did this calculation and I'm assuming they thought that a nanosecond is too small. We'll have to go with a minute. So I thought, what about if we worked backwards? from the minute that it takes in the film to melt the metal, we work backwards to find out what's the temperature of the neutron star that they're using on this weapons forge of Nidavellir. I think that's pronounced right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Let's now define the properties of this metal Uru. And you know, if anyone from Marvel is watching, I have defined them to have a melting temperature of about 25,000 Kelvin which is kind of you know, the typical temperature of a lightning bolt and the specific heat capacity of water, okay? And then if we take our equation that we had before, this time of melt times by the mass and the specific heat capacity and the change of temperature over all the area and the Stefan Boltzmann and this temperature of neutron star, we can rearrange this equation again to give us the temperature of the neutron star. And so if you plug in those properties of Uru that we had before and that the time for melt should be about 60 seconds, then you get a temperature of the neutron star of about 8,700 Kelvin. So not 600,000 Kelvin, but if neutron stars, once they're formed, they form at these really high temperatures of like a million Kelvin, and then they cool throughout their lives. So if we've taken a measurement of how hot this neutron star is at 8,700 Kelvin, we can therefore work out how old this neutron star is in terms of like how long it has been cooling for to get from 600,000 Kelvin to 8,700 Kelvin. The way that it's modeled how the neutron star cools is as a black body, again. And so we're gonna use the exact same equation that we had before for the time of melting, but instead for the time that it takes the neutron star to cool. But instead we'll be using the specific heat capacity of the neut a neutron star, and the change in temperature will be from 600,000 Kelvin to this 8,700 that we had before.
Okay. So first of all, I had to try and find the specific heat capacity of a neutron star, which turns out is, you know, very woolly. <laughs> Amazingly enough, it's very difficult to measure how hard it is to heat up a neutron star or to cool down a neutron star. Uh, but there are a couple of measurements that I found in the literature. So I did find one in one paper that said that the specific heat capacity was 1 times 10 to the 29 joules per Kelvin. So if we plug all those numbers into the equation that we had before and we assume that our neutron, this neutron star is about 10 kilometers across, then we get a time that this neutron star has been cooling for of 46 million years, which is entirely plausible because, you know, the universe is about 14 billion years old. So, you know, that's nothing in the history of the universe, but it's definitely sort of lifetime of humans and gods and, the, and, and Earth, especially. So, you know, we can poke holes in the whole scene, but this nice little bit of thermodynamics and school physics really shows us that, you know, this could actually uh, be possible in a way um, to take the energy from a neutron star. At least there would be enough energy there. How you harness that energy and how you sort of, you know, collimate it down into a beam uh, to get it to uh, melt the actual metal itself is another problem for another day. But the idea is that the energy is there in the neutron star if you would need it. Do the exact opposite. And that's what quantum entanglement is. Poor Will, trapped in this parallel universe, if this entire universe was quantumly entangled with our universe, then anything that Will does in the parallel universe has to be reflected in our universe as well. The particles have to do the exact...